bringing together voices in child and youth healthcare. This is CAFC Presents. CAFC would like to thank the following member organizations for their generous support of our knowledge translation activities. The IWK Health Centre, the Children's Health Foundation of London, the McMaster Children's Hospital Foundation, the Children's Hospital of Eastern Ontario Research Institute, the Children's Hospital Foundation of Manitoba, the Montreal Children's Hospital Foundation, the Holland Bloorview Children's Rehabilitation Hospital Foundation, and the Children's Hospital Foundation of Saskatchewan. We would also like to thank the following Keystone and program partners for their ongoing contributions that support all of CAFC's programs and activities. All right, hello everyone and welcome to today's episode of CAFC Presents. I'm Doug Maynard, Associate Director at CAFC, the Canadian Association of Pediatric Health Centers. And uh, before we move on, I would also like to uh, take this opportunity to thank Alexion Pharmaceuticals for their support of our knowledge translation program. They're not new to CAFC, but new as a new uh, supporter of our knowledge translation activities. And Alexion is a global biopharmaceutical company focused on delivering life transforming therapies for patients with rare disorders. Alexion has developed the only approved complement inhibitor to treat patients with paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria and atypical hemolytic uremic syndrome, two life threatening rare disorders. Alexion is advancing a robust rare disease pipeline in the biotech industry with highly innovative product candidates in multiple therapeutic areas. And we're also excited uh, to welcome Alexion back to the CAFC annual conference this year, uh, which is being held in Halifax, Nova Scotia from October 23rd to the 25th. And uh, they will be sponsoring a breakfast session there titled Canada's Rare Disease Strategy, Why Now and What Next? And they'll be doing that along with our colleagues from CORD, the Canadian Organization for Rare Disorders, who we're going to hear a bit more from uh, uh, in just a few minutes uh, and more information as always can be about the CAFC conference can be found on the conference site at uh, conference.cafc.org. All right, so on with today's webinar. Uh, today's webinar is titled Teens with Rare Diseases, Helping Them Transition to Adulthood. Uh, as I mentioned, we're very excited to be partnering with the folks from CORD and grateful for the support of Alexion on this webinar. And it's a really great intersection of topics that are of interest to our community, the CAFC community, the child and youth health community across Canada and beyond. Uh, diagnosis and management of rare disorders is always a challenge that we hear about or hear from our, our members about. But the issue of children with chronic illness transitioning to adulthood and to the adult healthcare system is also of great interest to CAFC. And, and in fact, a few years ago, we created a community of practice on transition for youth. Uh, from pediatric services to the adult healthcare system. And we've also released, uh, recent, very recently, released a set of guidelines related to transitions that I'm sure uh, everyone here will uh, want to take uh, some time to look at. Uh, you can see it up on your screen there. It's available on the Knowledge Exchange Network. And, uh, and we, I think we can put a link into the chat box in your control panel so you, you can uh, get directly to that. So without any further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce today's panel. Uh, first, we have uh, Dr. Durhain uh, Wong Rieger, who is the President and CEO of the Canadian Organization for Rare Disorders, or CORD. She's also the Chair of the Consumer Advocate, Advocare Network and President and CEO of the Institute for Optimizing Health Outcomes. Uh, the list goes on and on and on. You can see all sorts of other organizations and uh, panels that she's participated in, both uh, nationally and internationally on the Knowledge Exchange Network in her bio. But Dr. Uh, Wong Rieger has served on numerous health policy advisory committees and panels and is a member of the uh, uh, Patient Liaison Forum for the Canadian Agency for Drugs and Technology and Health. Uh, she has her PhD in psychology from McGill and was a professor at the University of Windsor. Uh, from 80, 1984 to 99. Uh, she's also going to be joined by Brooke Alamang, who's a social worker specializing in adolescent health and mental health. Uh, she's worked clinically with adolescents and young adults with a variety of mental health issues and chronic health conditions, focusing specifically on transition from pediatric to adult health. Brooke has a wealth of experience in program development, quality improvement, and, evalu uh, and evaluation, and she's currently working in an innovative role as a transition navigator in the Red Blood Cell Disorders Clinics at SickKids and the Toronto General Hospital. Uh, so it's my pleasure to hand the virtual podium over to uh, Dr. Durhan Wong Rieger first, uh, followed, then followed by Brooke Alamang. Over to you, uh, Dr. Wong. Thank you so much, Doug, and huge thanks actually to Capsi for making this opportunity available to us. We had such a great experience at the um, conference last year, and it really opened up a lot of uh, certainly some awareness opportunities for us, but also some real lasting relationships as we're moving forth. Um, so this is a great opportunity. I'm going to present briefly in terms of where we are with the rare disease strategy. And as you can see, we're asking 
why now and what next. And then we're actually going to turn it over to the real meat of this presentation, and that is focusing on one of the key issues that we have, and that is care and support for children, but more specifically children as they're transitioning from the care that they get in a pediatric institution over into an adult setting, which, as we all know, is difficult enough when you've got any kind of chronic condition that a rare condition can be just overwhelming for, for, the, uh, for the young people. So we're delighted to, to be able to share and talk about this. But let me just start with a bit of an overview in terms of who is CORD, what are rare diseases, why do we need this strategy, what are we calling for, uh, the kind of support that's taking place, and uh, what we're looking at in next steps in terms of the implementation. So just starting with a little bit of who is CORD. I mean, CORD is, in fact, our um, organization for... Um, sorry, I'm just trying to get rid of our little sidebar. Uh, perfect. Our, our organization for rare diseases, we're a network of, about a, of patient groups. So we're made up primarily of patient groups, very straightforward mission to improve the lives of all those affected by rare diseases. So we often work at the policy level. We work at a national level. Um, we also support the patient organizations in order for them to be more effective. Okay, we seem to be a little, oh, here we go. So what does CORE do? We support rare disease patient groups, advance the programs and policies, as I said, public awareness and support, and we also do support patient organizations. So what are rare diseases? Well, here's some of the interesting stats. Um, we use in Canada the definition that is probably most common, uh, the Europeans, is uh, rare disease is an, a condition that affects fewer than 1 in 2,000 persons, um, mainly internationally. Um, that being said, then, because there are some 7,000 rare diseases, uh, the startling fact is that about 1 in 12 Canadians actually has a rare disease. Not just a family member affected. It really means that there are 1 in 12 Canadians that will, in fact, be identified with a rare disease. 80% um, of these are genetic, but in about half of the cases, there is no family history of it. Sadly, two-thirds of these are children with rare diseases, and uh, frankly, almost a third of them will not live to see their fifth birthday. These are oftentimes severe diseases, debilitating diseases, progressive diseases, and in many cases are not identified, um, even when there may be preventive treatments that, that could be uh, put in place. And um, even though we hear a lot about uh, treatments for rare diseases, it's important to know that only about 5% of these 7,000 diseases actually has an approved therapy. So this is just a quick graphic to indicate that not to compete against other diseases, but frankly, rare diseases, there are more Canadians affected with rare diseases than with all cancers combined, than with diabetes, and in fact with, with heart disease. So it is in fact a major public health issue. So. I mean, and, you know, why then do we say Canada needs a strategy? It is that major public health issue. Rare disease patients, as we say, not only don't get diagnosed, even when their effective therapies don't oftentimes get to their therapies. The result is, um, for health systems, it certainly is that we waste resources while they're trying to get to access to the right treatments. And, of course, um, at the end of the day, the systems don't get much benefits out of it. We know that rare disease strategies work in other countries. This is not unique to Canada in terms of what is happening here. And, um, and certainly in Canada, we've seen the tremendous advances in areas like cancer, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, and most recently mental health, where we've introduced strategies for early identification, for uh, preventive education, for uh, interventions and certainly for a focus in terms of research and uh, centers of excellence that can actually treat uh, patients with the right kinds of supports. So this is what we're saying in terms of rare diseases. Even though there's 7,000 different diseases, the commonalities among them make it so that a rare disease strategy actually can have huge benefits. This is our little timeline here, and what we can see is that Canada, sadly, even though it does have one of the best healthcare systems in the world, and I think everybody would agree to that, in the area of rare diseases, we are really lagging almost everybody else. And you can see that this is, these are some of the developed countries, but I can tell you in developing countries, I'm going to Colombia in two weeks, um, 
Latin American countries are moving ahead of us. Mexico has a you know an orphan drug rare disease policy. Colombia has introduced a policy. Honestly, we really need to put that emphasis in terms of rare diseases in the same way as we have in other chronic conditions, but also in terms of other countries. So what are we calling for? Well, we have been doing consultations since about 2012. We launched the strategy at Parliament Hill in 2015. And what we're saying is that it is now time to make it more public, to get more people engaged, and to actually then to coalesce the uh, support behind it. We've got five key goals, so it's actually quite straightforward, and this is not a surprise to anybody. We need to improve early detection and prevention, and this is something that uh, is quite straightforward. We want to make sure we get access to the care that is available, evidence-informed care, community supports, even where they exist, oftentimes don't get to our rare disease patients. We want to make sure that there is sustainable access to these new therapies, and that's key for us in terms of Canada and also supporting innovative research. And these are three principles that are you know, central to what we do in Canada, equity of access, patient center care, coordination, collaboration, works across all of our other sectors and certainly works in many of the uh, chronic disease areas, definitely, you know, needs to apply in terms of rare diseases. I'm not going to belabor this and take up too much time because I do want to make sure that we get to a lot of time for the um, for our discussions around uh, transitions. But this is what we're saying. And what we do know is that in Canada, a lot of these resources exist. As we're talking about improving early detection and prevention, we're not talking about needing to create whole new labs. We're not talking about needing to bring in a whole lot of new uh, tests. We're not trying to talk. We're talking about you know doing something that's not available. We do need to ramp up what we've got. We do need to make sure it's available. We need to make sure that we've got the resources available to family physicians, pediatricians, and certainly to the families. But in many respects, the programs exist. We just need to make sure that they are used effectively, and most importantly, we've got to link them nationally. I mean, it's a, it's a shame that in Canada, uh, we do not have, for instance, consistent standards around you know, newborn screening. Uh, this is something that's a tragedy, and so that we have some provinces that are testing for as few as six conditions, and some that are testing for up to 33 conditions. So depending on where you live, you may or may not have your child identified if um, he or she is born with a rare condition. So we need to make sure that we're doing this across the country, and we're implementing those early detection preventive services. Good news is that a lot of diseases could actually be prevented with early intervention. We need to make sure that the right information gets there. And this is actually a, just a little in summary. This is one of our board members, actually, who's got a little bit yet here. I mean, 33, he struggled his entire life trying to get a diagnosis. And he says it wasn't until his daughter was born and she had some of those same symptoms that he said, okay, time to get serious. Let's see if we can figure out what it is. And the two of them actually got diagnosed at the same time. Interestingly enough, there is a therapy, and what he says is, thank God, she'll never have to suffer the way I did. But that shouldn't be an accident. That shouldn't be something. That should be available to everybody. Getting um, timely, equitable, evidence-informed care. What we want to make sure we've got is rare disease training for GPs, pediatricians, other healthcare professionals. And it doesn't mean that we're going to, you know, want to have everybody know 7,000 rare diseases. But there are strategies, there are trainings that increase the awareness and the, the uh, willingness to actually refer patients. If we've got the right centers of expertise, we can refer patients there. They can then pick up in terms of providing the right diagnosis, developing clinical practice guidelines. Disease registries, many countries are introducing national registries for rare diseases. We need to get on board and do the same thing. Going down to Colombia, as I said, Colombian government has now begun an epidemiological study to identify rare diseases in their country. We really have the resources here. We just are not implementing the centers of excellence and virtual networks are key. Again, not necessarily creating a whole lot of new sites, linking them, making them known, making them available, getting the right resourcing into them so that they can actually provide that additional support um, is, is essential. But really what we want to make sure is that we are able to have these resources available to patients and families when they need them. And you can see from the stats, for the most part, Patients are not getting access to resources even when they're available, and that means that long delays in terms of people getting the right treatment. And this is, again, just a little, little vignette. Again, a woman, rare disease, she's got um, Cushing's disease. She actually, uh, in fact, forced and got her own diagnosis by, you know, doing what so many people do, going onto the website and then, you know, 
coming back time after time in order to get access. Trouble is, she says, finally, even after getting diagnosis, she found that the medicines that were available elsewhere, because in many cases our patients are using medicines that are off-label in terms of their indications, couldn't get it covered. Uh, so she has become one of our most effective advocates in terms of not only encouraging other families, but also paving the way for how to get that diagnosis, and in fact has brought a new clinical trial to Canada for her condition, which will include obviously other patients. Third one is to enhance community support. What we know is that the patient community is a key. Many of these groups are really supported by very small patient groups that are linked obviously across the web, but are also um, linked internationally. We, we have very little resources for these patient groups. Many of them all operate off of their own kitchen tables. Some of them are huge, of course, and have become major sources of information, expertise, and registries, but many are also very, very small. And we need to make sure that all of this is available to, to everyone. So the importance of community support, I love this, um, and uh, Brooke uh, will also know this child as well. Uh, what, I mean, this is a child who actually has a rare condition. She gets monthly transfusions. She, for many, many years, was doing nightly infusions of a terrific therapy. And she, nothing has stopped her. She, you know, is a competitive cheerleader, competitive dancer, um, gave a speech here for her graduating class, and she's going to Queens this fall and is one of the people who's been the beneficiary of the transition program that Brooke's going to talk to you about. So absolutely amazing. And what we say is, you know, if we provide the right support, we can actually have all of our kids, you know, or at least many of them are able to, to achieve the kinds of, uh, of goals that uh, some of these have. So getting access to the right therapies, getting that right diagnosis, making sure that we've got drugs that are available in Canada, uh, focusing on, on research and development for many of these drugs as well. It is a huge challenge. We recognize that it's a struggle for um, drug programs to actually be able to keep up with all of the drugs that are coming through. But honestly, for many, many of these patients, this is when they actually do get a drug, it is going to be the first drug that they've ever had that's going to be effective. And it's really challenging and really heartbreaking when there is a drug therapy and in many cases the patients are not able to get it because our system has not been properly set up to make sure that they do have that timely access. And you know, this is and in progressive diseases, as we know, you don't get a second chance sometimes. It may be too late by the time you actually get the therapy. So this is, again, a huge focus for us. And this is, again, a little vignette about uh, a, a young man. Well, it's not that young anymore. He's and his wife, and they've been fighting for access to a therapy. Um, he was misdiagnosed, got the wrong therapies, was on um, uh, plasmapheresis for many years, um, consequently lost a kidney. Um, had a kidney transplant, but because he still had the disease, he actually lost the second kidney. There is a therapy for him. We're working and have been fighting really to try to get him access to the therapy. So, I mean, the challenge has been he can't get another kidney transplant unless he's on the therapy because he'll lose that kidney as well. And he does actually have a kidney in waiting. Uh, unfortunately, the drug uh, plan is not set up in such a way that he actually qualifies for the therapy. So this is something that, again, is, is a real challenge in terms of how we make sure that the guidelines and access are, are written in a way that they really do serve our patients. And then the last one, of course, is no, um, I think, surprise. We need to make sure that Canada is able to focus the kind of resources that we have in terms of research on rare diseases. And I will say is that, you know, CIHR, Canadian Institute of Health Research, have been tremendous partners in terms of promoting and providing research. Genome Canada has really been a huge supporter in terms of the personalized medicines and, and uh, rare diseases uh, research. It, Canada has, without a doubt, some of the best researchers in many of these areas, from genetics, genomics, um, you know, early modeling in terms of mouse and other kinds of models for, for studying rare diseases. We just need to make sure that we're going to continue to not only invest them, but to network them and to actually be able to leverage the discoveries coming out of that community. So this is hugely important for us. Have that dedicated funding. Make sure that we've got the partnerships that exist. Surprise, I mean, support has been rising. Again, you know, we took this on a cross-country tour last year to kind of bring in more partners and raise interest. We were hugely, I think, pleased with the kind of support we got from right across uh, the country in BC, in Alberta, 
um, in, obviously here in, in Ontario, this is something that um, affects everybody and it's really important that we've done. Certainly our clinics and our research labs as well as our politicians and the public involved. We had some excellent coverage around some of this and again, get in turn that the public understands. But the other thing that happens on these tours is invariably we get a lot of people that call us and identifying, you know, how this affects their own community and obviously a lot of people who may not have been aware that they actually had a rare disease that was the cause of it. Uh, our yellow stars became our emblem last year. We were delighted to wrap Parliament Hill and all the parliamentarians actually wore the scars. We were at, in Ontario and we were truly delighted that not only did Ontario government actually acknowledge rare diseases, but Minister Hoskins came in and actually announced that Ontario would be implementing Ontario's rare disease strategy. So the first province to actually pick it up to really put some commitment into rolling out a strategy that would bring together the resources and the um, and the support in terms of, of moving it forward as, a, as, as an important Ontario issue. So implementing the strategy as I said early wins um, from Ontario certainly I think this is something that we want to make sure that we continue to work with and really delighted certainly in terms of sick kids and the lead role that they're taking here in Ontario but also CHEO um, and also right across the country in terms of BC, Montreal, etc. Um, in terms of their engagement. So this was our Rare Alliance Canada. You can see our new logo. The goal is to actually engage multiple stakeholders, um, not just our rare disease community, of course, but to now formalize this alliance, get a steering committee together, a little bit like the Canadian Partnership Against Cancer and the huge advances they've made in terms of cancer. Um, I think uh, everybody was thrilled in the U.S. when uh, President Obama announced the moonshot for cancer. I mean, this is what we need. We need that same kind of a moonshot here in rare diseases. And we think Canada is as good a position as anybody in terms of the expertise that we've got in terms of making some huge advances in terms of rare diseases. So we need to have the orphan drug regulatory framework implemented. It's been ready since 2012. We're still waiting for it to be in, in place. It will allow support for actually research and development in terms of rare diseases. We need that rare disease program. I think again, we were thrilled when Ontario stepped forward to say we can do this, but we need to make sure that we also have access to the drugs once they're developed. And this is something again that we've been working across the provinces to try to get coordinated action. We have been given a commitment in January of this past year that there will be something presented at the Health Minister's Conference this year. We're a little bit in despair because in 2006 they sort of said the same thing, so we're kind of like 10 years later still waiting for a national program for drugs for rare diseases to be implemented, but we are truly hopeful that uh, with continued support and effort on everybody's part that we will see this happen. We've seen other countries that have come forth with their own kinds of funding programs and, and again, it really is essential in terms of making sure that right across the country, if you have a rare disease, you can get equitable access, um, but also the same level of access that you might have for a more uh, common disease. And so our rare disease program, drug program, Manage access program. I'm not going to go into this. We can talk about this in terms of how those kinds of programs can be implemented, but really to recognize there are strategies that are workable. I just want to end. I always love to end with our Arctic Quest. This is a, a trek that we took, um, the, gosh, it's been five years now. We took a group of rare disease patients up to the Arctic Circle. Thank you to really indicate that, you know what, you know, patients with rare disease are just like anybody else with the right treatment. Almost anything can happen. So thank you very much. I will end it with that, and then I'm going to turn it over directly over to, to Brooke, who uh, is going to talk about the transition program, and then we'll open it up for questions there. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Jorhan. Thank you so much to the organizers for the invitation. It's a real privilege to be on this call and to be talking to you today about the Comprehensive Transition Program in Hemoglobinopathies and the innovative care model of care that we've implemented um, beginning in 2014. So Durhan's given you a nice um, overview of Canada's rare disease strategy and I'm going to be speaking to you about how we support adolescents and young adults in Toronto with two particular rare diseases, namely thalassemia and sickle cell disease. So my objectives for today are to outline the rationale for transition support in rare diseases, paying particular attention to the two populations I work with, which are sickle cell disease and thalassemia. 
I'll provide an overview of the innovative model of care in transitions that was implemented in 2014, describing a bit of the background and how this program came to be. I'll then sort of break down each of the components of the model of care and give you some preliminary findings from our first two years of operation. I'll then describe some of the successes, the challenges, and the lessons learned from the first two years of this project, and end by discussing some of our next steps. So some of you may have seen this sort of visual before. I wanted to begin by differentiating between the terms transition and transfer. So as most of you know, transition is a real process of growing up ready to take on the challenges of adult life. And in the context of healthcare, it's the purposeful and planned movement chronic health conditions from pediatric to adult oriented care. Now this is differentiated between transfer, which occurs at a single point in time, and often that takes place at the age of 18. Now although transfer takes place at that single point in time, I would argue that many young adults with special health care needs are actually still developing many of the skills they need in order to advocate for themselves, self-manage, and navigate a new health care system well beyond that mark at age 18. Now this is a concept that was taken into account when we developed the model of care to support patients with sickle cell disease and thalassemia throughout transition. So why do we need to pay such close attention to this area of transitions? Well, we know from a number of research studies looking at a number of different patient populations that the transition from pediatric to adult care is a period of high risk for youth with chronic conditions. It's associated with a number of things, including healthcare dropout. So this is where patients don't make it from their final pediatric clinic appointment to their first adult appointment, or they don't engage with the adult system even if they do make it to that first appointment. We also see that many patients are lost to follow-up, so we often have issues contacting patients if they fall through the cracks. We see that many 18-year-olds are changing addresses and changing phone numbers, which can make it difficult to contact them, uh, so many may be lost to follow-up throughout this transition. Poor treatment adherence is seen in this age group. Um, this could be for a whole host of reasons, but really there are competing priorities, lots of things going on developmentally for young adults and for adolescents. It can also be a time of risk taking and even rebellion. So these sort of may be some of the reasons why we see poor adherence to treatment across the board. We see increases in morbidity and mortality rates, as well as increased use of the emergency room and hospitalizations for particular patient groups. And when we take all of these factors together, that can relate or result in some poor health overall, overall health outcomes. We also know that around age 18, there are many life transitions taking place outside of the healthcare transition, which may include moving off to post-secondary education, moving out of the family home for the first time, and joining the workforce. And finally, as healthcare providers, we often expect that young people take on more responsibility for their health care at age 18 based on how our healthcare system works. But we know that many patients actually lack experience with self-management because patients or parents play such supportive roles in the pediatric health care system. So why then is it important for us to focus on transitions in hemoglobinopathies, or sickle cell and thalassemia in particular? Well, these are chronic healthcare conditions, they're, they're blood cell disorders, and for patients with sickle cell disease in particular, this is a very important time in their lives. So the 18 to 24 year olds, we've seen from a number of studies, actually have the highest number of hospitalizations and emergency room visits compared to all other age groups with sickle cell disease. Now that's compared to older adults in their you know, 50s and 60s, that's something we wouldn't necessarily expect to find. We also know from accounts of our adult hematology providers that many patients coming from sick kids to Toronto General Hospital demonstrated a lack of knowledge about their healthcare condition and sort of a lack of experience with many of the self-management and advocacy skills they need to manage their care. This again may be related to the protective environment that we foster in the pediatric system and parents' involvement. Now going back to this loss to follow up point, many patients with red blood cell disorders prior to the implementation of the 20 transition program were being lost to follow up and falling through the cracks. And we know that this was happening at a time when they were really most at risk for the complications to increase with their blood cell disorders. 
The long wait times between the final pediatric appointment and the first adult appointment often left many patients unsure about when the transfer would occur and the expectations of their adult health care providers. And finally, the Red Blood Cell Disorders Clinic at SickKids transfers about 50 to 60 patients a year. That's a pretty high volume of patients, so it was clear that a coordinated and streamlined process was needed to ensure that these transitions happened in a timely and safe way. So we then took to a needs assessment. The pediatric and the adult healthcare providers recognized many of these issues in transition and carried out a really short needs assessment in 2013. 12 patients at Toronto General Hospital were administered a survey and they were asked what would have been helpful for you to do before coming to the adult clinic. Now as you can see on the slide, the large majority thought that seeing the clinic or going on a tour would have been helpful ahead of time. 67% would have benefited from meeting with their adult providers prior to the transition. 42% would have benefited from creating some sort of portable or medical summary they could take with them to their first adult appointment. And 42% would have benefited from some experience in having a clinic visit without a parent or guardian present in order to prepare them for transition. So before we actually developed the program, we sought to conduct an environmental scan so that we weren't inventing the, real, the wheel. What kinds of transition support and models already existed so that we could learn from these programs. So I just put a couple examples on this slide, but we know there are some really well-established hospital-wide transition programs in Canada and the United States. So just a couple examples in Canada include the Good to Go transition program at SickKids and BC Children's On Track program. Both of these provide support and consultation to both staff and um, patients throughout hospitals focused on transitions. They develop generic tools that are available on their websites, including timelines, resources, and um, other tools that can help people to prepare for transition. There are also resources in the United States, like the GOT Transition Center for Healthcare Transition Improvement, although it's not listed on this slide. They look at the six core elements of transition and really focus on how to measure outcomes in transition. So these models were really taken into account when developing our program. There are also models like the patient navigator model in Winnipeg called the Maestro Project. Now this is sort of looking at a service navigation model uh, for patients 18 to 25 years old with type 1 and 2 diabetes. So I connected with this patient navigator before we got started with our program to find out about the type of work they were doing. We know in sickle cell disease in particular that there have been pilot projects focused on transition um, in the states. So Hankins and colleagues established a pilot program in 2012 for adolescents with sickle cell disease and this included a tour of the adult sickle cell disease program, a lunch discussion with pediatric staff following the tours and scheduling of the first adult appointment by a pediatric nurse case manager. So this model was found to be acceptable and feasible, and most participants did establish a connection with an adult medical home following the program. There was another program that looked at providing group education for adolescents with sickle cell disease to prepare them for transition. This involved providing information about sickle cell disease, self-management, sexual development, and psychosocial supports. They did find that adolescents in this study had increased knowledge scores after attending their sessions, and they also identified some of the emotional concerns that adolescents had in reference to transition so that these could be addressed in clinical practice. Finally, there are targeted patient education programs available online for young adults with sickle cell disease, and one example below is the St. Jude's Transition E-Learning Program. So this is divided into different education modules, and there are pre- and post-quizzes that allow youth to learn about their condition in a way that really makes sense to them. So considering everything that's been done and the needs assessment that was carried out, SickKids and Toronto General Hospital sought to pilot a cross-appointed transition navigator to implement a comprehensive transition program. This was initiated in collaboration and consultation with SickKids' well-established Good2Go transition program. And it's important to note that this program began in July of 2014, and when it got started, it was initially a six-month pilot project. 
Now we're going into our third year of operation, which is very exciting. So this slide provides an overview of some of my responsibilities as a transition navigator. Before I get into the activities, I want to note that I'm a social worker by background. However, this role was open to any master's level healthcare professional with research background and an interest in transition and adolescent health. So as a transition navigator, the majority of my time is focused on clinical activities. So I meet with patients from ages 12 to 21 years old, and I focus on educating them about their condition, providing self-management counseling, and service navigation. I coordinate monthly transfer clinics and assist with the delivery of information between institutions, and I'll speak more to what those transfer clinics look like in upcoming slides. Finally, I'm involved in research and program evaluation in order to assess the impact of this transition program on patient outcomes. So here we have an overview of the model of care that has been implemented to support adolescents and young adults with sickle cell disease and thalassemia in making safe and smooth transitions from pediatric to adult care. As you can see, transition preparation begins as early as 12 years old, if that's developmentally appropriate for the youth. And you can see at the bottom here that my role spans across both the pediatric and the adult sites. I'll be breaking down each of these components in the upcoming slides. So the first component of this model is transition preparation, which typically begins at age 12 and goes up until about age 16. There are three main outcomes that we hope that youth will achieve while they're in the transition preparation phase. First, we'd really like youth to have a thorough understanding of what their health condition is and its implications on their future. Now, one of the ways that we support youth in accomplishing this task is by administering a condition-specific readiness tool, and then we can identify what their knowledge needs are. I'll talk about that further in the next slide. We also want to encourage young people to begin gradually taking more responsibility for their health. Although my early conversations with younger teens often involve parents and caregivers, as adolescents get older, we try to incorporate more solo time into clinic visits where parents step out of the room so that the young person can begin practicing their communication and self-advocacy skills. I also support them in identifying any goals that they have related to transition and the steps that they need to achieve them. And an example of this could be learning to fill a prescription. We would then break down all of the steps needed in order to accomplish this goal. Finally, we want adolescents and their families to have a thorough understanding about what to expect in adult care and what the transition process entails. I find that transparency from the outset can really help to build trust and allows you know, the patients, the parents, and the providers all to be on the same page when it comes to transition. I review and provide patients and families with a written transition policy, which outlines the support we provide, the timeline for transfer, and expectations of adult providers so that there are no surprises when they reach age 18. I also want to highlight that in this transition preparation phase, complex cases that require additional support would be identified. So although 12 might seem really young to, beginning, to begin talking about transition, having these conversations early can allow us to figure out if there are complex cases where youth might require support from adolescent medicine, neuropsychology, psychiatry, or the Good to Go transition program. This can help us to ensure that we're starting the process for getting these services in place early so that youth don't experience any gaps in funding or supports when they reach age 18. I want to spend a couple minutes talking to you about how we assess readiness in these patient populations. So I've developed two condition-specific readiness assessment tools, one for sickle cell disease and one for thalassemia. These are surveys which assess each young person's knowledge of their health condition and their self-management skills using multiple choice questions. There are also a couple open-ended questions at the end of the survey that ask them to highlight some of their biggest worries or concerns around transition so that those can be addressed throughout our clinic appointments. So far, and these were adapted from Good2Go's um, generic readiness checklist, which are available online. 
So far, 210 patients with sickle cell disease and 53 patients with thalassemia between the ages of 12 and 18 have completed a readiness tool. The results of these surveys really allow the entire healthcare team to identify priorities for patient education. We can look at their responses and determine where gaps exist and where we might intervene to begin talking to youth more about their health condition. For example, some youth you know, may be prescribed a medication that they need to take every day, but may have no idea what the purpose of the medication is or the long-term impact. So that would be an area for us to discuss with the young person. We can also provide transition plans that we implement for patients and uh, we work with them gradually over the course of their time at SickKids to fill in any of those gaps. These surveys are also uploaded to the electronic patient record so that the entire team can have access to the results and the progress of each patient. So, as each patient approaches their 18th birthday, they're booked into a dedicated transfer clinic appointment. These clinics take place at SickKids, but they involve not only the pediatric team, but the Good to Go Transition Program team and one of the adult hematologists. These clinics happen on a monthly basis, and so far we've held 19 clinics with 74 patients having gone through the process. Before the clinic begins, we hold the joint rounds at the pediatric site where we involve the adult providers in a joint discussion about each of the patients on the list for that day. We usually book about six patients into these clinics and we share information back and forth about psychosocial history, adherence to appointments, and readiness for transition. Some of the key pieces that maybe wouldn't be in the patient chart but might fall between the lines so that the adult providers get a sense of the patients who will be coming over to their practice. Each patient has a joint appointment with their adult provider in the presence of their pediatric hematologist and in the familiar sick kids environment. They have an opportunity to ask questions about adult care and just meet their adult provider in sort of a, a light environment before they actually make the transition. Each patient creates a My Health Passport, which is a wallet-sized medical summary, and this came out of the needs assessment um, results that I discussed earlier. You can see a picture of what a completed passport looks like on this slide. We usually encourage the patients to keep this with them wherever they keep their health card so that if ever they experienced a health care issue or emergency, they would have all of their information handy. I provide each young person with a transition resource package and review the contents with them. So some of the information in that package includes a thorough contact list for all of their adult team members, a map of how to get to the new clinic, post-secondary planning information, and we, we create with them their adult, uh, their adult blue hospital card so that they're all set to register for their first appointment when they make it to Toronto General Hospital. They're then presented with a graduation certificate, which is signed by each member of their pediatric health care team. And this sort of reframes the transfer of care as a positive and important milestone that they can be really proud of. Many patients are quite tearful and see the transition as a bittersweet time because they're saying goodbye to this team that they've developed such rapport with. But I think using the certificate is a nice way of reframing it. I then walk across the street, since Sick Kids and Toronto General are so close together, with the patients, their parents, and one of the adult nurse practitioners to give them a thorough tour of the adult clinic and discuss where to register and what to expect at that first visit. And we book their first adult appointment then and there so they know exactly when they'll be coming back to be seen by the adult provider. Patients also complete pre- and post-clinic evaluation forms so we can assess their satisfaction with the transfer clinic process. So I'll give you a sense of some of our early findings. So when we asked how much information patients got about leaving sick kids, you can see that 94% rated that they received just the right amount of information about leaving sick kids. When asked if they felt better prepared to leave sick kids and move on to adult care, we see that 67% did feel better prepared, and in total, 99% felt at least somewhat better prepared to move on to adult care. 
Looking at overall transfer clinic ratings, these are really positive findings. So 72% rated the clinic experience as excellent. And again, we see 97% thought that it was you know, at least good, <laughs> good or excellent. So really positive feedback there. There are also some open-ended questions on those evaluations, so I wanted to highlight some of the, the key quotes and some of the themes that we're noticing from the patients in those clinics. So I'll read through these. So overall, I enjoyed the transition clinic and I definitely feel more comfortable about attending an adult hospital. Another patient stated, I found the tour to be useful and helpful. I liked creating the My Health Passport card. Another patient noted that they learned new things about transition. And we hear this theme again and again, patients really appreciate getting lots of information and support about the transition so they know exactly what to expect. The transition clinic staff were super helpful and answered all of my questions. And I liked that I was able to meet the new team and that I got to see the place. So they get to see the place they're going to be going. And I find that that alleviates, alleviates a lot of the anxiety these young people have about leaving their comfortable pediatric environment and, and going into a new setting. So the final component of this model of care is the post-transfer support that I provide to the young adults uh, between ages 18 and 21, once they've already been transferred to Toronto General Hospital. So the support that I provide, I find, is really customized based on the needs of the young person, as we recognize that some 18-year-olds are developmentally more prepared for transition than others. I also want to note that we look at transition much more broadly than just the transfer from a pediatric to an adult hospital, and this is reflected in the types of support that we provide. So I provide appointment reminders for the first year after an 18-year-old makes it to Toronto General, and this is either by phone or email. I ask for their preference. I provide service navigation support, so often that means physically meeting one of the 18-year-olds in the lobby of Toronto General Hospital and guiding them up to the clinic for their first visit. I continue to support them in developing their self-management skills and provide lots of support around employment. So I find that youth really value um, employment and education throughout this 18 to 24-year-old age group, so I, I kind of start with where they're at. I provide handouts, tip sheets, and community resources that will help youth in obtaining jobs that are meaningful to them. And in terms of the transition to post-secondary, I develop lots of resources and tip sheets so that they can um, consider financial support. There are a whole bunch of scholarships that youth with chronic conditions are eligible for, so I provide them with a list of those, and as well as tips on applying. And sometimes it even means liaising with either the high school or the post-secondary institution to make sure they're getting the support that they need. So accommodations are um, something that comes up really often in the work that I do, particularly around getting um, 18 and 19 year olds registered with the accommodations offices at their college or university. I've had a couple patients who have struggled with the workload because the transition has been challenging and they're trying to get used to the new environment and their health condition and complications have increased post transition. And sometimes they've been penalized at school if the, if the post-secondary institutions aren't aware of their health care condition. So I often encourage each young person to register with the accommodations office so that they are aware of their health condition and can arrange for certain supports like note-taking services if youth are in the hospital or attending a, an appointment in the hospital. So I administer another survey at the end of their first appointment at Toronto General, again to assess their satisfaction with the transition experience. So one of the questions we asked is how prepared you felt for your first appointment at Toronto General. You can see again, 67% felt totally prepared for this appointment. When we look at their level of comfort in speaking for themselves with their adult providers, we see that 71% felt totally comfortable. And this could be because we're encouraging you to have these conversations with adult and pediatric providers on their own before they turn 18. So I think this speaks to the value of beginning this gradual transition preparation at a young age so that it's not such a shock when they reach the adult system and parents are asked to step out of the room. 
When we look at overall transition experience, it's overwhelmingly positive, with 76% of respondents noting that the transition experience was overall excellent. Again, I took a snapshot of some of the feedback that was left on some of the open-ended questions on these surveys. So one of the questions we asked is, what was most helpful in preparing you for your transfer to Toronto General Hospital? So one patient noted, I had a successful first appointment without my parents. It was an easy team for me to communicate with. Visiting the adult hospital before my appointment really helped to prepare me. Another patient said that having someone to walk me through what I had to do and where I had to go was the most helpful thing in preparing me for adult care. Having the phone calls and the emails from the transition navigator about appointments and what to do to make things easier for my treatment helped me to prepare. Finally, the healthcare team did an amazing job at making me feel comfortable at my first visit. So I think this speaks to the high level of buy-in from both the pediatric and the adult providers. They recognize that these 18-year-olds who are coming into their practice may have different needs than the 50 and 60-year-olds that they're taking care of. So I think they're making a real effort to welcome them into their practice. I also sought some feedback from the pediatric and adult multidisciplinary red blood cell disorders teams that I work with to get some, some of their comments and thoughts about what this transition program means to them and some of the differences they've noticed since we've implemented the program. So the nurse practitioner stated that the role of the transition navigator has brought to light the importance of identifying gaps in care and education that patients need addressed in order to cope successfully in the adult system. It was great to see how the parent let their team take the lead in the clinic visit and give them a chance to answer and to ask questions during their appointments. Patients seem more responsible and they're wanting to learn more about their chronic illness, so this speaks to them being more active participants in their own care. Instead of just receiving it and letting parents take the lead, they're, they're wanting to become more involved and I think they're more empowered with the knowledge that they gain about their health condition. With a dedicated transition navigator, transition is now a smooth process that alleviates many fears patients and parents used to have about leaving their pediatric center. Another provider stated that patients are more willing to ask for help with other issues such as school, post-secondary education, or relationships. So again, that speaks to us as a team, I think, looking at transition more broadly as just moving from one institution to another. When we did the My Health Passport, I was impressed by how much the patient knew about their health condition. This is another theme that comes up. I see that youth, once they complete the readiness surveys, are recognizing their own gaps in knowledge and are seeking out their own research on their condition and asking lots of questions in their appointments. So this allows them to become much more knowledgeable. So I wanted to end by touching on some of the successes, the challenges, and the lessons learned from the first two years of this transition pilot project. Overall, I think we've developed a really coordinated and streamlined transition process, and we're delivering high-quality, patient-centered care to a vulnerable population by assessing transition needs really early and developing patient-centered plans to meet those needs. It's clear that patients and providers do see value in the transition program, and I think this is reflected in some of the, uh, the quotes and the comments that I read throughout the presentation. I think it's definitely a success that we made it past the six-month pilot project mark and that we're now going into our third year of operation, which is very exciting. We've also received international recognition. Myself and other members of the team have been asked to speak on our transition pilot program in many you know, conferences, both in Canada and the United States, including at the National Institutes of Health. There are no other programs that are so well established, and the role of a transition navigator is very new, particularly in the sickle cell and thalassemia populations. So we're getting lots of exciting feedback, and people are really interested in the work that we're doing. In terms of some of the challenges that we've experienced, I would say that the, the number one challenge is really focused on the sustainability of this transition navigator role. 
because it's not funded through the global hospital budget, we're relying on sort of short-term funding, um, and this is making it really difficult to create a really long-term vision when you're working on these short timelines. Having joint pediatric and adult clinics on a monthly basis has improved the transition process and experience. However, it means that there are multiple perspectives and multiple stakeholders sort of around the table. So lots we need to take into account when preparing for transition. I found that having open dialogue at the pre-clinic transition rounds has been really helpful in allowing all the different team members around the table to voice their opinions and have their say. Finally, in terms of transition, um, it's clear that the impact of the interventions that we implement aren't evident right away. This can be a real challenge when funders are interested in cost savings and numbers really quickly. So if we're starting this transition program you know, at age 12, we may not see the impact of the transition navigator role and all the supports that we're investing until that patient reaches the adult care system at 18 or 19. So it's really long term and that's one of the major challenges. So I wanted to end with some of the lessons learned from the first two years of this pilot program. First of all, I think there is a need for buy-in from all stakeholders, so not just the pediatric side, but the adult side as well, and from patients and families. It's important to seek continuous feedback throughout this process and to be flexible. So that's why I'm administering so many patient satisfaction surveys, and I'm asking staff and families what you think of this program, what kinds of things are you looking for throughout transition, and what other supports would be helpful. I've adapted many of the tools, resources, and even the transition clinic process based on some of this feedback to make it as patient and family centered as possible. I think it's important that we don't reinvent the wheel. We know there are so many experts out there and lots of different guidelines that exist, including the CAPC guideline we heard about. Um, so let's, let's collaborate, share resources, and talk to others doing similar work. For us in this project, the transition navigator role clarity piece was really critical, especially because there is a social worker on the pediatric team and a social worker on the adult team. So I really needed to, from the outset, identify that my role was particularly focused on transition and transition issues, and we needed to be clear about when to refer out to the two other specialists on the team and in the hospital. I think considering targets for program evaluation from the outset can be really helpful in terms of how you implement and want to evaluate the program. And I've learned that documentation and collecting data on an ongoing basis is really important. Um, I'm often asked for reports and, and um, data that goes back to funding bodies and stakeholders, so having that handy and up-to-date is really useful. So our next steps include a really thorough evaluation of this program. So the first step of this evaluation is a retrospective chart review. We're just wrapping that up in the next two weeks, actually. And we're looking specifically at appointment attendance and medication adherence. In the cohort of patients who transitioned to Toronto General one year before the initiation of the transition program versus patients who transferred one year after the transition program. So we want to get a sense of where the, whether there were any differences in the way that they utilize the healthcare system and how adherent they are to their medications. We will also continue to develop resources, particularly for those patients with complex medical needs. So perhaps they have more than one diagnosis, have an intellectual disability, or a cognitive impairment. And I'm working very closely with the Good to Go transition program on these resources and pathways for these complex cases. I think I'll end there and I'll leave my contact information up on the slide. I'm happy to answer any questions that you have and connect with you either by phone or email after the presentation. Thank you so much. All right, thank you very much. Uh, great presentation from both of you. Uh, lots of great information and, and again, as, as was mentioned a couple of times, 
Uh, lots of information about transition programs on the CAFC site. All of those, all of the information there was pulled from various programs from across the country, including the two that you that Brooke mentioned: the Good to Go, Good to Go program at Sick Kids and the On Track program at uh, BC Children's and and others across the country. So lots of information there if you're looking for different variations and permutations of transition programs from across the country. But lots of lots of common principles. Hence the the reason the group came together to uh, to talk about that. And Brooke did a great job of of, of, in, of identifying what some of those common principles to support transitions are. Uh, we did have a few questions about accessing the slides. We will be able to make, I think, uh, as long as our presenters are able to share them with us, we will make the slides available on the Knowledge Exchange Network after the fact, along with the uh, recording, so we should be able to get access to those. Uh, uh, and, and if you do have questions, please don't hesitate to type them into the uh, question box at, at any time now. Uh, we did have a few questions about the Transition Navigator program. Uh, just uh, some clarification on the, the status of that program it, being a pilot. They were wondering if you were the only one and if it was only in the blood disorders clinic or if as a Transition Navigator you dealt with patients across the organization or from different departments. Mm -hmm. So my particular role is specific to sickle cell and thalassemia. We do, I work closely with the Good to Go program. So the staff from Good to Go do provide that consultation and support hospital-wide, but our program is specific to uh, sickle cell and thalassemia. And my role as this transition navigator is a pilot. So I'm the first one in our institution that is dedicated to a particular population. And going forward, I mean, I guess maybe looking into your crystal ball, you see what you mentioned that you know it's about getting funding and, and convincing people that this is an important role. Do you see it being a hospital-wide thing based on departments within the hospital, or do you? Is, what's the importance of it being within a particular department? How important is it to understand each disorder, for example, or is it just about transition navigation in general as broad principles? What just your your your, your opinion on that? Mm -hmm. So I think one of the things that we've noticed uh, in terms of having a navigator in this particular program is that I'm able to meet and provide consultation support with every single patient going through the program. So we have large patient numbers, but I think there's a lot of value in meeting with each young person starting at age 12 to identify what their transition needs are, their education needs, and to provide them with some counseling and guidance on what to expect in adult care. I mean, it's one thing to give a handout that discusses what to expect, but I think to engage with and allow youth to begin practicing some of those skills that they'll need to, uh, you know, communicate with, with providers when they reach the adult system is really valuable. And it's also great, I'm, I'm able to develop rapport with each of these young people so that I can hopefully continue to engage them when they reach the adult side. And I think that continuity of care piece is something that all the patients I've worked with have really valued. So having me involved beyond that 18 year old age mark and, and following them for about a year post transfer allows them to have sort of more of a soft landing into the adult system and just some extra support. Um, so knowing you're, you're on your own as transition navigator for this pilot program, Janie's asking how many people are on, your, on the transition staff and I think she may be thinking the, the good to go program in general. So can you give us a sense of how many people across sick kids are involved in transition in general as, as, as their primary role? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the Good to Go program has um, three dedicated staff. There is Kushamaria, who is the psychologist and the team lead, Geraldine Cullendine, who is a clinical nurse specialist, and Megan Hens, who is an occupational therapist, and they provide that transition support hospital-wide. But then I'm on, like I work very closely with the, the hematology clinic teams at both SickKids and Toronto General, and they're all very invested in transitions in our clinic specifically as well. All right. So knowing that many of the things that you talked about are sort of general principles for transition, you know, you laid out your, your sort of a model of care with the preparation phase and the, the follow-up phases and, and that sort of thing. What have you noticed over the in your time as the transition navigator that, that might be unique to the blood disorders clinic? So what if people were setting this up, what are the things that if you're if they're familiar with transition issues what would be unique to these children coming through the red blood cells disorders clinic? Well, I think one of the things that we know is that with sickle cell disease in particular, about 10% will have experienced either a stroke or a silent infarct. So that can lead to many issues with learning um, and cognitive issues. So I think that's where identifying what their learning needs are and setting them up with the proper accommodations so that they can succeed in school is really important. 
Um, we also know that sickle cell disease is really unpredictable. So many of our patients have these unplanned pain crises and can end up in emergency rooms. Um, and so they really need to have a good understanding about what their condition is and be able to advocate for themselves and explain what their health care needs are in an emergency situation. That's where I think the importance of patient education comes in and where the My Health Passport can be really helpful. You know, many healthcare providers really don't understand what sickle cell disease is, and that can make it really challenging when you show up into an emergency room in pain and aren't getting the help or the care that you need. So by having these young people, I think, really have a, a thorough understanding of what their needs are and be able to articulate those in a, um, a seamless way can be, it is really, really important. All right. Thank you very much. And Nurhan, f feel free to jump in on any of these questions as well. I'm sure you have uh, lots to offer as far as those those issues in transition that are unique to, to children with rare disorders that, that may be other, other disorders. I mean, can you give us any, any insight into that? Just sort of, you know, lots of children with more common chronic illnesses like diabetes or even cerebral palsy being more common than many of these. What are some of the things that are unique to other rare disorders that tr that people in transition programs might need to be aware of? Probably um, most unique to the rare disorders is that there is not necessarily an adult site mm -hmm. that they can go into. I mean, even with some um, hemoglobinopathies, I think, as Brooke is saying, we do not actually have you know, good adult clinics at uh, TGH or other places that they were transitioning into. And one of the challenges in terms of transition is there's nowhere to transition to. Mm -hmm. So one of the huge advantages of this type of program is actually to create adult clinics as well, where their care can be coordinated, where you've got um, other health care specialists you know, that they're seeing, whether it be for other kinds of uh, you know, um, developmental issues, whether it is in terms of um, transition issues as, as one is, you know, um, looking at in terms of other kinds of organ cons considerations, etc. Mm -hmm. if, if you don't have specialists that are mm -hmm. attuned to these rare conditions, it is very, very easy for these patients to get lost. So I think one of the huge advantages has in this. I mean, if we look at conditions like sickle cell disease, um, I mean, the closest I can think of it are things like um, cystic fibrosis. They've done a tremendous job in being able to have adult clinics where, again, mm -hmm. we've got kids, you know, who then go into an environment where there are adult specialists that are not necessarily just a specialist in uh, cystic fibrosis who can also provide the other kinds of supportive mm -hmm. care. Uh, hemophilia, you know, again, a blood disorder, but probably one of our leaders in terms of having good adult sites, comprehensive care clinics, and again, really built out of the specialists um, in those communities and the patient community. So that, you know, real commonalities, um, I think as you're saying, in terms of many of these conditions, is that once they get transferred to an adult site, you do not necessarily have mm -hmm. uh, adult um, uh, care providers who are, have any kind of knowledge in terms of what you're doing. And I think, again, as Brooke was saying, showing up an emergency. Mm -hmm. um, for many of these kids, and again, this is why this program is so wonderful, it is, it's, you know, they go away to school. Mm -hmm. So again, they don't necessarily have people around them that are able to provide the kind of support that they are used to having. I mean, in, it's, a, it's wonderful that we've got kids with rare diseases who are actually going into adulthood. In many, many of these diseases, as we know, it's a real challenge. Children do not necessarily survive and thrive in adulthood. I mean, I look at some of our lysosomal storage diseases, for instance. Um, now we've got great treatments there. But um, the other thing that I think is a commonality is the management of the condition. Um, um, many of these conditions, thalassemia is a good example, sickle cell disease is an example, even where there is good care, like diabetes, right? The, person has got to do a whole lot of self-management. And that doesn't mm -hmm. mean just, you know, taking the therapy. It also means being very self-aware in terms of what situations might be occurring with them. It means that they also have to be disciplined in terms of their diet, in terms of their exercise, in terms of their stress management, in terms of their sleep, fatigue, etc. And quite frankly, I think as Brooke is saying, in many cases where they've had really, really good pediatric programs and really, really good parents, they don't know how to do this themselves. Mm -hmm. And certainly you're thrown into this world, um, and especially again if they go away, if they're working or go away to school, we have seen over and over again young people who fail, and it's heartbreaking. You know, kids that you've seen get such good care and are doing so well, 
And of course, you want them to exercise their independence. You want them to be able to do well on their own, and you want to give them their freedom. I mean, we all know, and I think this book said, it's a time in which they're kind of branching out and, mm -hmm. and doing all this already. But on the other hand, you know, they've also got to be prepared for the fact that, you know, you, unlike many of your other your peers, you've got really catastrophic uh, risk mm -hmm. if you don't manage. And that's really hard for us. Um, so we're very, um, you know, interested. We've been trying to do what we call some peer coaching programs. Hemophilia is a great example where they've got a buddy program. You take an older kid who's got um, hemophilia, you buddy them up with a young kid, and two things happen, right? One is that the young person actually has somebody they can look up to and say, oh my gosh, yeah, I can be like you, and, you know, as an adult. But you, the most important thing is that this young adult suddenly has to kind of pull up their socks and actually kind of you know, to live clean because you got somebody else who's also looking up to you. So, you know, and it reinforces their own needs. So some of these, I think, things that, you know, that are, are, are taking place, are, you know, are really very important, but engaging the peers themselves in order to take on a role for, for themselves. And we'd love to see in the Human Office program, you know, maybe uh, some emphasis as well as the program is developing and how you develop peers mm -hmm. who actually be transition advocators for mm -hmm. other peers mm -hmm. and or to be ongoing, you know, as they've gone into a uh, mm -hmm. adult. So many of our young people. So yeah, there are lots of commonalities, but certainly as we know with the rare diseases, especially with those that require chronic care, mm -hmm. you know, engaging those people, young people on early on and giving them support so that they can actually, you know, be successful it is pretty common. I just, I just wanted to point out, uh, I think, I can't tell if it's a little piece of paper that there are notes that you might have rustling near the computer microphone or a bracelet that might be dragging on the desk that's uh, coming through on the microphone uh, sometimes when you're talking. Just uh, just wanted you to be aware of that. But uh, but just as you had started answering that question, Durhan, uh, Isabel jumped in uh, at, before you even said it, so we'll give her the, the benefit of, of, of saying it before you did, that, that she's, she agrees exactly with what you said about the challenge of with rare disorders is that they don't fall into a, plen a particular clinic in many cases, and they travel between a variety of specialists and coordinating that as a challenge and, and she said not only is there no adult clinic for them to go to often there's no pediatric clinic specific pediatric clinic for them to start with in the in the first place and the parent ends up coordinating that it ends up as the coordinating clinic she puts in in quotes that the parent takes on that role so she says having a transition clinic is a real advantage uh, to families who are struggling so she totally agrees with that that issue of many of these rare disorders not having a specific clinic uh, uh, is really a, really a big issue um, Brenda uh, is asking uh, if you think the role of a transition navigator needs to be neat, like, as we were talking about earlier, does it need to be condition specific or could a transition navigator provide pre and post transition support to multiple conditions at the same time? And how many patients do you think uh, a transition navigator, navigator could support at one time? A really good question. We actually looked at expanding the, the transition navigator uh, model across all of the hematology clinics at sick kids, but we support we're hoping to provide that, that that case number would just be too large. I think it could be depending on how you implement the model. It definitely could go across various groups. Right now, what I do is I'm usually meeting with the 12 year olds on a yearly basis, uh, 12 to sort of 14 year olds on a yearly basis, and then I become more involved and see them uh, two times a year as they approach their transition age. I mean, you could definitely scale back and be seeing patients less often if they're doing really well, and just be more involved for the patients who are really complex, require that education and that support um, more thoroughly. Uh, I think it's just around how you want to implement the model. So um, I think it's definitely possible. And at this time, um, I think my caseload is about 300 and 315 patients. Um, and that's manageable. But I think if it grew any larger, we'd really need to think about how we can scale back the number of meetings because I'm also doing, you know, evaluation, resource development, uh, program planning, and those types of things. So can I ask both a question here, um, Doug? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So, my, uh, so we've seen, um, and I know that um, Alberta tried an experiment with it. What about having any of these kids in group meetings? 
So we can't, I mean, do, are there groups, support groups? And again, mm -hmm. it could be cross disease, but it also could be disease specific, you know, mm -hmm. so that they again are drawing some support from each other. Mm -hmm. That's definitely a great idea. So we do hold at Sick Kids some patient and family education events where we bring together, we have a post secondary specific event that's particularly for teens with hemoglobinopathies, and we've had fantastic success there. It takes a lot of planning, but we've had great success. And then we have the patient and family education sessions that bring together patients of all ages and their parents as well. We've seen wonderful support there. Um, I've asked teens and I find there are different experiences. So some teens are really willing and um, looking to engage with other people around their condition and they, they want that, that support and engagement, but others are much more private about their condition. So I think it really depends on the person, the patient population and their willingness to engage. Um, we've definitely looked at this peer mentorship model at SickKids and I've me and the social worker at Toronto General have linked up particular patients who seem like they would benefit from that support or who have asked for it with particular individuals but I think having a more um, sort of streamlined process would make sense um, groups we, we would like to look at it's just a matter of resources and uh, you know finding the ideal time but that's something to definitely think about in moving forward because that I know that peer support piece is really critical all right, thank you. Uh, another question from Heather. Uh, she's saying, uh, for Brooke, um, what's your experience in working with children and youth with developmental disabilities in that they may have another condition that impacts their social emotional development that might affect their ability to take responsibility for their own care as they transition into the adult system? Have you worked with any children and families in that regard? Yes, yes, we have. Um, really good question. So that's where I would also draw on the expertise of the Good to Go Transition Program. And this is where we're trying to develop these pathways and sort of timelines for how we actually begin looking at funding for Developmental Services Ontario and different supports that they'll need when they turn 18. It's really, I think, a team effort here. It's not just me who's involved in looking at transitions. I think um, partnering with other clinics and other groups. I would also reach out to other clinics so if they are being followed by one of the other clinics for their developmental issue at Sick Kids or a community organization, we develop those partnerships and relationships. Um, but I think the key there is really to look at what their needs are and what they'll need when they leave Sick Kids, whether it's Ontario Disability Support Program, you know, a re like respite services for those with the physical conditions, um, and Developmental Services Ontario, and initiating all the paperwork and the support and the um, the guidelines and everything nice and early so that there is no gap in funding when they turn 18. All right. Well, I think that is the end of our questions. Um, if anyone, oh, we do have uh, one last comment that came in we'll, that we'll, uh, we'll, we'll share with you and then we'll, we'll after I share this comment with you guys, um, Brooke, maybe we'll go to you uh, for any, any closing comments that you might want to leave the audience with, and then we'll hear from Durham to, to sort of wrap it off with the final word. But first, we uh, Isabel put in a comment that says cross-disease monitoring, or sorry, cross-disease mentoring uh, can be helpful, uh, and a lot of uh, and a lot can be not so much around support, but in pooling a knowledge base and realizing that each has a bucket of skills to share. She feels that's truly empowering. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, Brooke, anything you'd like to leave uh, the audience with? Uh, just any closing key messages? I think just to, to follow up on that last comment, I think collaboration and sharing resources is really important. I do. I think that the CAPC um, transition guidelines that have come out have been so fantastic. So it's really just about even if you don't have a dedicated transition navigator or you know someone who's looking at this issue in particular. I think it's about looking at how you can build transition um, support into your practice in little ways. Um, and again, I think looking at transition more broadly is a really important concept. So recognizing that these young people are going through so much developmentally, psychosocially, uh, you know, when they're 15, 16, 17, going up to 25, taking all that into account um, is really important and looking at what they value uh, can help to really keep them engaged in the healthcare system. All right, thank you very much. And Durhan, the final word, what would you like to leave the audience with? Certainly one of the things that we're pushing with regard to Rare Alliance Canada is the support for what we would call centers of excellence, centers of expertise. In Europe, they're creating European centers of excellence, and these will span across the 27 
uh, well, maybe not only 26 countries in the EU. And, and the idea would be that these are not just specific to one condition, but they would be to clusters of conditions that are similar, similar primarily because they are actually um, run in, you know, by a, a group, the same group of healthcare professionals. So they would have a similar group of patients underneath them. And we would certainly love to see you know, those centers of excellence um, set up in Canada, but also within those centers of excellence, recognizing that many of these uh, conditions are in fact um, starting when, you know, with children. As we said, 80% do affect uh, our genetic and about uh, two-thirds of them affect children. I think this would be really important. One of the really important things we've seen, as Brooke mentioned with the program, is that it's been an ability to link the pediatric centers with the adult centers and to actually, in her case, to really foster the development of the resources at the adult center. So we think this is a really important part of a model that we would see around disease uh, clusters, rare disease clusters in terms of centers of excellence. So we'd love to see how we can pick up this concept and maybe look at what other kinds of funding need to happen, what are other kinds of, um, of outcomes that they're achieving that could be used in order to leverage the right kinds of support into these programs. So really, I think it's a very exciting concept. All right, well, thank you very much for that. And uh, with that, I think we'll wrap it up. Um, so thank you, uh, uh, Brooke Alamang and Dr. Durhan Wong Rieger for such a great presentation. Um, and as I mentioned at the beginning, we're very excited to have uh, Dr. Wong uh, Rieger come back at our conference uh, again with our colleagues from Alexion to uh, to continue this discussion about rare disorders and what we could be doing in Canada. Uh, as far as the regulatory framework, et cetera, and all sorts of other great issues that we'll have a chance to dis discuss at the conference. So uh, thanks again to Alexion for their support of our knowledge translation program uh, and their sponsorship and uh, of, of both uh, the, this program and, uh, and the conference. Um, we do our webinars every Wednesday at 11 a.m. Eastern Time, usually. We're on our summer slowdown right now, so our next webinar is not until 7, uh, September 7th. Uh, but it's always great when you can watch live, as these questions really are the part of, sometimes, often the best part of the, of, the, of the conversation is the questions from the audience and the discussion that it generates. But when you can't watch live, we do record these sessions and make them available after the fact on the Knowledge Exchange Network at ken.cafc.org. Uh, we usually have the recordings and the PowerPoint presentations available uh, within a couple of days uh, after the webinar. And as I mentioned, our next webinar will be September 7th and will be titled Making Injury Data Accessible, Visually Pleasing and Useful. Can it be done? Well, if it can be done, uh, if anyone can do it, it's uh, Dr. Ian Pike and, and Dr. Allison McPherson. Uh, Dr. Ian Pike from uh, University of British Columbia and uh, Dr. Allison McPherson, familiar to many of the viewers of this uh, program uh, from York University. Uh, they are from the CIHR team in child and youth uh, injury prevention and they've created the Canadian Atlas of Child and Youth Injury Prevention. Uh, this is a, a project uh, that addresses a recommendation that Canada choose a set of indicators co uh, comparable across in institutions and organizations to monitor, monitor injury. And some of the outcomes of that research was the development of this atlas, which has three components, an injury dashboard, an injury re research insights section, and an injury data online tool, which is designed to facilitate and simplify access to data for injury prevention stakeholders. And there's five tools available, injury-related deaths, injury hospitalizations, transport-related injuries, and sports-related injuries and drowning. So that's going to be really interesting. Uh, and that can be found at injuryevidence.ca if you're interested in, in checking that out before the September 7th uh, podcast, uh, uh, webinar. So we hope you enjoy the rest of your summer, uh, we'll hope, and then we hope to see you back here on September 7th. So thanks again, everyone, for, for joining us today. Bye, everyone. <laughs>